Hi, well, thanks for, for joining me here today. It's a real privilege to be a part of this event. So, to kick things off, uh, my name's Chris Nesbitt-Smith. I'm based in London and currently work with some well-known brands like Learn Creates, Control Plane, eSynergy and various bits of UK government. I'm also a tinkerer of a bunch of open source projects. I've been using and abusing Kubernetes in production since it was 0.4, so believe me when I say it's been a journey. I've definitely got the scars and war wounds to show for it. So we'll, we'll have some time uh, and, and space for kind of questions, so please uh, do leave comments. Uh, great to hear where you're joining from, so please kind of let, let me know uh, in the comments or Q&A. So, the history of pets versus cattle terminology is muddy at best, but most link it to a presentation Bill Baker from Microsoft made in 2006 around the uh, scaling the SQL server. Way back then, in the before times, we called ourselves sysadmins, and we treated our servers like pets. For example, Bob. Well, Bob the mail server, if Bob goes down, it's all hands to the pumps. The CEO can't get his email, and it's effectively the end of the world. We do some incantations, uh, make some sacrifices at an altar, and resuscitate Bob, bringing him back from the dead. Crisis averted, cue the applause and accolades for our valiant sysadmins who stayed up late into the night. In the new world, however, servers are numbered or maybe given uh, UIDs or GUIDs, like cattle in a herd. For example, Web01 to Web100, and when one server goes down, it's taken out the back, shot, and replaced on the line. But why am I telling you this rather morbid story? Well, Kubernetes deals with all these problems, right, and saves us from the tyranny. And you're right, it does. All of your computers are all called nodes and abstracted and given arbitrary names. Also, scaling groups and such will automatically detect the sick in your flock and take them out and bring a replacement in, all while seamlessly each rescheduling the workload that was on the failed machines. And Kubernetes takes this a step further. Your workload also has unique names. Like the physical service, your workload failures can be detected and replaced almost seamlessly. So, where's the pet, you might ask? Well, what's the first thing you do with a brand new Kubernetes cluster? I can you hint it's not deploying your application or anything that your business cares about. Something like that look familiar? Yes, we had to do a load of things just to make the cluster able to start running our workloads. And it's worth noting that with a trend towards more and more features being kind of out of tree, that is to say that they're optional add-ons and don't ship with the core Kubernetes. So examples of this are things like flex volumes uh, and uh, policy uh, with kind of, uh, pod security policy kind of going away. And basically all of the kind of Kubernetes SIG projects that many find essential is only kind of exasperating this issue. That might work for you when you've got, say, one single cluster. But what about when you've got dev, integration, staging, and QA that your app all needs to run on as well? Or worse, when you need separation between your teams or products. So maybe you've automated that with some Bash, Ansible, Terraform, whatever you like. Well, cool. Good on you. However, you will find that it won't really be very long before there's an updated version, perhaps patching a vulnerability that you care about, and you may be stuck trying to test every single application across your estate. So this is what we're calling day two operations in the new world. We used to call it BAU, or business as usual, and it's in effect where reality kind of catches up with our idealistic good intentions. You'll quickly find that your clusters are running kind of various versions, and given the rate of change in the community, it's unrealistic to run latest everywhere. Co uh, certainly not confidently, without breaking the production and disrupting your operational teams. Permutations, therefore, of seemingly common tool choices. So some teams might use Kong, others Nginx, others Apache, all for the exact right reasons, I'm sure those seemingly infinite possibilities across the estate will emerge. Sad times, right? Well, congratulations, you're now the proud owner of a pet shop. Or, if you manage to automate the creation, you can perhaps call it a pet factory. But, it's still a headache. So, what? So, so what? So how, do you, how does this hurt, you might ask? Well, maybe you like pets. 
Well, presuming, of course, you're in cloud, your world could be roughly summarized into a few tiers. So you've got applications. Well, these are things that your boardroom know about and can probably name. So think your public website, shopping cart system, customer service app, online chat interface, email system, etc. Well, these are implicitly providing some value in of themselves to your end customers. And then you've got infrastructure. Well, with cloud, this is all commodity, thankfully. Uh, the days where anyone in your business was caring about the challenges of physically racking up hardware, not overloading the weight in the cabinet, and taking pride in how well they've routed the cabling have hopefully all passed. And your consuming infrastructure, hopefully maybe you've codified this, but even if you're into click ops, making sure that it's running is no longer your problem. No one in your business should hopefully be conserved with hardware failures and patching routers every time there's a critical vulnerability, testing the UPS, the generators, and upgrading the HVAC when you need when you add more servers. Yawnorama, as my 16-year-old would say, and then curse me for repeating. Well, your interactions with any of this ultimately becomes a few clicks or lines of code, and some infra is available to you with an SLA attached to it. If only the story ended there, though. So, but sandwiched between those is a grey area of all the operational enablers. So, this is where your DevOps or SRE team live. So, think log aggregation, certificate issuers, security policies, monitoring, service mesh, and many others. These are the things you do because of all the sorts of reasons ranging from mis risk mitigation to emotion and technically unqualified opinion, or just without foresight of what was around the corner in six months. And let's just make the leap and assume for a minute that you are more technically competent than your Goliath multi-billion dollar cloud vendor. Well, you've completely negated many of the benefits of going to cloud in the first place by ripping up the shared responsibility model. All of this, which is fascinating, uh, technically fascinating for people like me to stand and stroke my beard at, is delivering absolutely zero business value. Unless, of course, your business is building or training on those products. And who'd be mad enough to get into that business? And that's not all. Well, recruitment. So you might think that you want a DevOps, right? Well, no, wait, DevOps with Kubernetes experience. Maybe a CKA? Oh yeah, well, it's on AWS and we use Linkerd and in some places Istio. No, not the current version or even the same version everywhere. A mix of pod security policy, Caverno, OPA for policy, some Terraform, Helm, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, soup all going on in a mono repo, apart from all the stuff that isn't. Well, we're well and truly back in the remit of commodity, uh, commo uh, outside of the remit rather, of commodity skills and back to hunting unicorns. Sure, you'll find some victims, sorry, I mean candidates, that you'll hire. Well, now you've got one hell of an onboarding issue before they can do anything useful and help your business move forwards faster than it did without them. And if you hired smart people, they'll come with experience and their own opinions of what worked for them before. So your landscape gets bigger and bigger and more complex and diverse. I did some Googling. So this is what the CNCF landscape looked back and what looked back way back in 2017, heady days, right? With choices, right? The choices as far as the eye can see. Have you seen it recently though? I mean this has got a bit out of hand. I'd say someone ought to have a word, but I suspect that'd just make things worse by adding just yet another thing. And don't get me wrong, started on operators. I mean, nice idea, but they betray the ideals of immutability with crazy levels of abstraction. For and if you've seen the ideas around like mutating admission controllers too, and if you're really mad, you can nest these things with operators that create CRDs for other operators that are all mutated. I mean, heaven forbid someone bumps the version of anything. And no doubt, all held together with sticky tape, chewing gum, pipe cleaners, thoughts and prayers, and. Helm. A string-based templating engine where any community module has to eventually expose every parameter in the object file abstracted by a glorified string replace. So now I've got to have in my head all of the complexities of Linux or Windows host, 
how the container runtime works, the software defined network and the storage, the hypervisor before the container, the scheduler controllers, the auth, the policy and any mutating policy in the cluster. Before I worry about how someone in the nested Helm chart mess of hell has mapped the replica count of one of the deployments to a string called DB replica count, and how that has changed in a new version of a dependency not following Semver to database replica count. So instead of having my expected three, I have now only got one. When I could have just written a YAML patch for the replica count and a deployment object of the database resource using a stable API version with schema validation for free. The kids doing Kubernetes don't seem to have learned from the past. Don't get me wrong, I love open source community with all my heart. It is so important to everything. And it's simply not possible to do anything without it. I mean, sorry, not sorry, yes, as a sidebar, every talk this year is contractually required to reference Log4j. This is my slide, I deal with it. It's not relevant, it can come out in just a couple of months. Okay, everything, literally everything that exists around us depends upon it. And the community is brilliant at building some truly remarkable, very high quality things. But I argue we must accept that the open source community is awful at packaging these things up in a way for consumption uh, by introducing needless abstractions. But enough of all of that, I'm definitely going to hell for those last few slides. Happy place, Chris, happy place. Okay, where was I? Right, yes. So through all of this, I can't possibly think of a faster way to go from enthusiastic engineers playing with some exciting new tech to deeply unhappy ones trying to fix something at 4 a.m. And before they can do anything meaningful, they've got an orienteering exercise to switch mental context to whatever the intended permutation of things is that they're looking at. Meanwhile, your business value delivering apps are offline or at worst, at breach. So rewind a minute. We didn't want any of these things. How did we get here and what can we do about it? Honestly, bin it all. Kill it with fire and then learn to love vanilla. Vanilla is great and delicious too. Does anyone remember Kiss? No, not the band. Keep it stupid simple. So, or keep it simple stupid. In any case, embrace the shared responsibility model on offer and make your cloud vendors do more than just provide you some compute. Turns out, as it happens, they're not that bad at it after all. I'm not daft. I know it's not sexy and exciting and you might even find recruitment harder if you're used to hunting magpies which follow the shiny and don't like the boring stuff that just works. So to answer the question posed from the title of my talk, is it time to uh, put your pet Kubernetes cluster down? Yes, yes it is. Uh, and in the immortal words of S Club 7, if you can bring it on back immutably from code all without anyone noticing, and yes, I'm referring to the original version of those lyrics, then maybe, just maybe, it can earn the right to stay to die another day. I've been Chris Nesbitt-Smith. Thank you again for joining me today at an enduring kind of my self-loathing rant. Like, subscribe, whatever the kids do on LinkedIn, GitHub and um, whatever else. You can be rest assured that there'll be little or no content on, uh, or any spam since I'm awful at self-promotion, especially on social media. Uh, and cns.me just points at my LinkedIn. Talks.cns.me contains this and other talks and they're all open source. Questions are very welcome on this or anything else. Uh, I'll be in the comments section. Uh, so kind of, yeah, please do, do reach out.